What was I saying? <laughs> Good job, A plus starting. <laughs> <laughs> um, Amy texted me and she said from my dare challenge question thing that I have to list 10 facts about myself, which is a very difficult thing to do. So, uh, if you've been on each of our individual pages on the blog, you'll see we have some of us have facts about ourselves. Uh, so here are 10 random so facts so about me that I don't think you'll find on my about page. And I have them written down because it would take me too long to think of them on the spot. So, I once laughed so hard that I threw up because of the word butts. Uh, I go to sleep around 5 a.m. and I wake up around noon, like, every day. She killed a bear once. Thomas said I killed a bear once, but that's not true. I love to scare people. It? Just yesterday, uh, I spent 10 minutes laying behind my couch on the floor waiting for my mom to sit down so I could scare her. I did, quite successfully. And I scared Justin as he was coming out of the bathroom at 1 in the morning. And he said he almost killed me. Fun times. Uh, I'm also easily frightened. I'll jump even if the toaster pops. Not a fan. Uh, according to Thomas, I read hipster books, and he told me to say, I've lived some, but you've probably never heard of them. That didn't sound douchebaggy enough. <laughs> Redo. No. Number six, I have a tattoo. Uh, number seven? Number seven. Am I mistaken? In the past year, I've stayed in Pennsylvania, Georgia, Florida, and Nevada. It was also my first time flying it on an airplane, and I lost feeling in my hands because I was so scared. That's not a fact. <laughs> I probably should have added it in there, though. Related to that, though, I have three anxiety disorders. That's probably why I lost feeling in my hands. Uh, I filmed all of my episodes in Amber and Thomas's house. I've not filmed a single episode in my own house. Um. And number 10, I'm the shortest person that you will see in on the videos. As you know, my episodes are about history, and so I thought today's episode would be facts that people believe due to propaganda, stuff like that. Just, it's so widely believed, but it's not true. So, uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is Paul Revere. So Paul Revere warns everybody that the British are coming, the British are coming, you know, you imagine him riding through villages late at night just screaming at people. No, that is wrong. That is the opposite of what happened. Mm -hmm. Okay, so according to eyewitness accounts and what Paul Revere wrote himself, he rode to like villages, towns and stuff saying well, not shouting, just kind of discreetly telling people that the regulars are coming out. It wasn't just Revere either that was warning people of the British. He warned a bunch of patriots along his route to Concord. The, the patriots he told would ride off and tell other patriots. And it was actually a pretty common warning system that had helped the U.S. out a lot before up until, like, the French and Indian War. So, Revere starts warning others, and the next thing you know, there's like 40 different men on horses in Middlesex County also going out warning others. So, it's pretty efficient, works pretty well. Uh, and not only was it, like, just those riders and Revere, Revere had two other guys riding with him. It wasn't Revere who completed the trip. One of the guys that was riding with him was uh, Samuel Prescott, who he met on the road. Dr. Prescott, uh, Dr. Prescott apparently was, and I quote, returning from a lady friend's house at the awkward hour of one in the morning. Colonial booty calls. What are you gonna do? Uh, the other man was riding with Paul Revere from the beginning, and that's William Dawes. So while they're heading to Concord, they're actually detained by a group of British soldiers that they encountered at a roadblock, conveniently enough. So Revere is captured by the soldiers and he's questioned at gunpoint, but Samuel Prescott manages to like jump over a wall with his horse, escapes into the woods. William Dawes also escapes, 
but shortly after, he falls off of his horse and doesn't complete the trip. Like, come on, Dawes. You had one job. One job. Uh, so we're left with Dr. Prescott, who makes the Concord safe, unharmed. Okay, according to Thomas, Thomas's words, he did a lot for his country. And Revere gets all the credit, because his name rhymes with more thick. The next story I have for you is about the guillotine. Uh, a lot of people think that the guillotine was invented in France and that's where it originated and the reign of terror and Robespierre and all that chopping off people's heads. I guess that's sort of true. I mean, that's the first time it was called the guillotine, but it was not the first machine created for just decapitating people. The first one was actually created somewhere in the 16th century. Uh, historians aren't really sure where. It's called the Halifax Gibbet. I'm pretty sure I'm saying that right. No wonder they renamed it. So, it was created in, you guessed it, Halifax, which is in West Yorkshire, England. So, uh, Thomas Deloney attributes it to a friar who came up with it as a solution to the difficulty of finding local residents willing to act as hangmen. And I can see how that was a difficult problem. You don't really want to be responsible for killing somebody. The Halifax gibbet was about five feet taller than the guillotine. And instead of an angled blade, like, you know, how you picture the guillotine and it's got like that razor sharp blade, they just had a giant axe head that just sat up there, held up by a rope. Uh, the axe head was seven pounds and twelve ounces, so you can just begin to imagine how horrifying that looked. To send the axe head down, to chop off the person's head, you could either cut the rope that was holding the axe head up, or you could like, you could pull out the pin that held the rope in place. So if you stole an animal, what they would do is they would get this cord and they would tie one end of the cord to the pin and they would tie the other end of the cord to the animal that you stole or if that animal was not available like you ate it or something I don't know they would tie the other end of the cord to an animal of the same species they would then make the animal run off causing the animal to pull out the pin sending the axe head down so the animal that you stole would kill you that's kind of awesome the last time a person was beheaded by a gibbet by law was in 1650 and it became forbidden because people were saying it's a little harsh to like brutally chop off a person's head for just some petty thievery the last person to be guillotined in france however was on september 10th 1997 not that long ago uh, but to be fair, he did force two girls into prostitution, and when he tried to force his girlfriend into prostitution, and she, like, called the police on him and sent him to jail, like, he got out of jail, and he kidnapped her, tortured her in front of the two girls that he, like, forced into prostitution, and, and then he went out and strangled her to death, and then he kidnapped another girl who escaped and reported him to the police. I've decided to end my episodes with a couple today in history facts. Today's technically March 3rd because I've been procrastinating on filming this. But since the day I was supposed to upload was March 2nd, that's what I have the dates for. That's what I'm doing. So, March 2nd, 1904, Dr. Seuss was born. Uh, 1978, grave robbers stole Charlie Chaplin's body. And in 1807, Congress abolishes the African slave trade. It's all pretty good stuff, except for the body stealing. But that's all I have for you. Beautiful dance that happened by chance, happened by chance, happened by chance. Not the opposite. Okay. I'll shut up. I'll get to the story now. The villages <laughs> rode horses to him to tell him about it. What? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I was... <laughs> oh. uh, 
It originated so in... like a 1920s boxing arena. Are you done? Halifax gibbet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like the cut of your gibbet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna Halifax you up. <laughs>